Uh, can you open up to 1 Corinthians 5 with me? Uh, and we're going to start in some text. We're looking at today the uh, uh, influx of the ancient heresy of Gnosticism. The way it affects and infects actually a lot of modern Christianity and some errors in, of, uh, in ways of thinking that come from it. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 6 and go to verse 12. There's some curly verses here. Uh, you will see where we go as I begin to explain. The word of the Lord says this, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I won't be dominated by anything, Paul says. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord Jesus and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? So shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one with her? For as it is written, the two shall become one flesh. It's not just about marriage, apparently. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. So flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. But do you not know that your own body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Amen. Amen. This pulls the rug out and blasts the foundation to smithereens of the, all of the mentality and the ideology and theology of Gnosticism. Now, Gnosticism was um, in its germinal seed form in like the first century, but it really came to fruition in the 100s into the 200s and following. And they, well, we'll go through like eight of their major tenets. But basically the idea of Gnosticism uh, is that the flesh doesn't matter as much, only the spirit matters. And as you read the New Testament, you can see that even though Gnosticism is not called that by name, uh, Gnosticism is not uh, sort of seen as its own religion or Christian cult sect, but the themes of it and the ideas of it, which came from Greek philosophy, are already being attacked by the apostles. So we see the same thing in this passage here. If you look in 1 Corinthians 6 again, there's six good arguments that Paul makes against the big, what, what is the beginnings of Gnostic teaching, all right? So <laughs> basically the idea of, the, of Paul's opponent or the ill-informed, ignorant, young, zealous, high sex drive, low intelligent uh, Corinthian Christian male, the argument that they're making is, look, we all know that there's some things that affect the body and some things that, are, that affect the spirit. Bread or food it just affects the body, right? It goes in through your mouth, into your stomach, and out through the, you know, the regions. It doesn't affect your spirit. It's not a spiritual matter. And we would all go, yeah, okay, that's logical enough. And so the, 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 uh, uh, the context shows us that the argument went like this. Well, there's other things that you can do in or to or with your body, and we should recognize they have no effect on your spirit. And this convenient... Uh, a young man, his argument follows and he says, and you know what? Sex is just like that. It's just bodily stuff. It's just getting rid of uh, uh, testosterone. It's just, a, it's just a physical thing. I'm not doing it with my spirit. I know that I'm, and maybe it was just a gal on the side of the road uh, in Corinth, or maybe it was going into the pagan temples and seeing their cultic prostitutes. But the argument was the same, basically going, in my heart and in my spirit, I love Jesus. I serve Jesus. I'm faithful to Jesus. It's only my body, which doesn't matter much anyway, that is going off and seeing the hooker. And that, that's not really a spiritual matter. So Paul, uh, now that's bad argumentation. If any of you new Christian or young men are thinking that that's interesting, we're going to blast that out of the water. Here's where he has six good, strong, waterproof arguments as to why that is not just wrong, but stupid. And the first one is God's going to burn you in hell, which I personally think is a tremendous argument and very demotivating from sexual sin. The argument, you know, goes in verse uh, uh, 13, goes like this. Well, the food just goes into my body and then my stomach, uh, yeah, and then leaves my stomach. And Paul says, that's a great argument. And food and your stomach will both be kindling on Jesus' judgment day if you keep acting like that. That's his first argument. 
God's going to burn you and your stomach and your other body parts if you're misusing them. The sexually immoral, he's already said back in the, uh, earlier in chapter 6, will not inherit the kingdom of God. So stop arguing that way. That's the kind of argument that future eternal kindling makes. Stop talking like you're going to get burned in fire. That's his first argument. His second argument is also you're not in charge of what is or isn't sin. That's right at the heart of what these guys are really arguing is, I don't think it's sin, and here's my reasoning. And Paul says, yeah, you didn't make your body, and you don't get to determine the purpose or the telos of the body. God made the body, and he made it for God. So he says that in verse, uh, four t- uh, um, uh, verse 13. The body's not meant for sexual immorality, so you're using it against its designed purpose, and a young man will say, I think it's a great design and a great purpose that I'm using this for. And look, all the pieces fit. I think this is a great way to use my fleshly sexual organs. And Paul says, you're thinking like a atheistic, materialistic human being. You're thinking like you, you're just pieces and you get to use those pieces however you wish. And as long as it works pragmatically, then, then, then that's perfectly fine. And Paul says, you're not just matter. You're not just a body. You're a theologically informed human being made in somebody's image. God decides what your body's for and it's not sexual immorality. The body is for the Lord and the Lord looks after the body. The third argument is God raised Jesus Christ in a physical body which tells us that everybody who is joined to Jesus by faith is joined to an embodied Savior, and we have an embodied salvation. So we're going to get to Gnosticism and Greek philosophy in a bit, but this is one of the big arguments they would make, is the body doesn't matter, and salvation is leaving our body behind, going up into the spirit realm. And Paul's saying that's impossible because God raised Jesus in a physical body. So God raised the Lord and he says, and will also raise us up by his power. So we're not told, we're just told it's a mystery. We're not told how it all works on a cellular atomic level of how this body that you're in now will be the same body you're resurrected in in the future, but it is the same body. We're supposed to think that way. This body that I use now, it's not like that rundown Corolla that every you know, first car buyer, young man buys and just drives it into the ground, doesn't get it serviced, it's smoking, every dial light is up on the dash and you just keep on painting them over with permanent pen uh, because it doesn't matter. I'm not going to have this car forever. I'm going to let it dry. I had a friend. It literally smoked, blew up an old Corolla on the side of the Logan motorway. He got out, closed the door, threw the keys away, left it behind. He just kept on getting emails from the government saying, hey, we're going to tow your car and wreck it if you don't come get it. He said, that's, that's a perfectly free, good way for this whole solution to come to an end. And eventually they did. And now some Christians treat their bodies that way. The Gnostics thought that way about their bodies. You're only in it for a bit. Drive it into the ground. Use it however you want. Do whatever you want with it. Because when salvation comes, you're leaving it behind. Paul's actually saying, no, you get it back. Imagine if on that guy's next 21st birthday, his dad get, tells him he's got a new car for him. And he unwraps it. And there's his rundown Corolla. That's the feeling Paul's telling these guys. Watch what you do with your body. You're going to get it back again. Thirdly, uh, fourthly, I don't know what we're up to. Uh, he also says, your bodies are body parts of Jesus. The bodies you're in are the members, he says, the limbs of Jesus' body. So you're down here. You are his fingers, his hands, his feet, his arms, his legs on earth. Uh, therefore, what you do with your body doesn't just matter to you and your future and your salvation. It actually also matters to Jesus because you're his body. Stop taking his body parts into a prostitute's brothel. It's a pretty strong argument that Paul says. He also goes on. Here's the other one. Uh, every, um, uh, he says, your body is not your, uh, sorry, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you from God. So, uh, you're going to get your body back again. Your body is not yours to decide what you do with it. It's God's. Uh, God's going to burn you in hell if you keep acting that way. Also, uh, not only are you in Jesus and therefore you are his body parts, but also Jesus is in you by the Holy Spirit. You're his temple. It's a capital crime to go graffitiing, destroying, or bringing prostitutes into the temple of the Lord God in the Old Testament, no less so in the New Testament. That's a serious sin. And then the last one is you don't even belong to yourself because we said originally God made the body, which is your body. So give to God in your body what you're supposed to. But secondly, he also bought that body again. So you belong to God t- twofold by creation 
and by redemption price at the cross. And all of this is not merely saying you as a person. Paul is intentionally attacking, uh, attacking the Gnostic theology, what would become Gnostic, and he's intentionally speaking specifically about your physical body. Therefore, he concludes in verse 20, So glorify God in your body, in your actual forelimb, one head, two eye, organs, skin, and flesh. That body, glorify God in and with that body. And the reason we start there is because uh, Gnosticism has really crept into the church again. It often rears its head over and over and over. Um, uh, and it's come into the modern church in ways that, well, really make men's musters and uh, sermons to men, they make it a necessity now because we've grown up in this sort of era affected by Gnosticism where you're told, listen, you're a Christian spirit. You're going to go to heaven and, and live a Christian uh, existence forever. Your gender, um, even the conservatives who don't believe you can, dis, you, know, you can change gender, they laid the groundwork for uh, trans and kids and uh, gender fluid ideology by basically saying you're a fluid Christian spirit. The fact that you're a man doesn't affect your discipleship much. Uh, the fact that this gal is a lady doesn't affect her discipleship much. You know, basically everybody just gets the same androgynous commands, which means non-gendered commands. And things like, you know, we'll, we'll go through them, but things like physical strength, uh, jobs, money, success, uh, uh, taking dominion in everyday ways. These things sort of get uh, 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 thrown to the side because a tacit Gnosticism has crept into the church. And so we'll go through the fundamentals of Gnostic theology and we'll have a look at how they sort of rear their ugly head in our day. Here's the first thing uh, that you should know about Gnosticism. History tells us that it was started by a Christian apostate. So in Acts chapter 8, Simon Magus, or the magician who worked wonderful demonic powers, right, new age guy in Byron Bay, that sort of dude, he was wowing all the Samar Samar uh, Samaritans. And when the evangelist Christians came uh, and, uh, and there was miracles being done and they were hearing the gospel and being saved, Simon was impressed and amazed. And then it's, you know, he believed. He wanted to attach himself to this contingent called the Christians with this amazing resurrection power they're talking about. Then when the apostles came down, they prayed over the Christians and they received a sort of a, a Pentecost 2.0. They received an infilling of the Holy Spirit and there was miraculous signs. And Simon said, that's amazing. I want to have spiritual authority over other people just like that. I don't want to earn it. I don't want to go the long route. I don't want to really know what it's entailed, but I have lots of silver from my magic practice. Can I purchase from you the power to dispense the Holy Spirit to people? And Peter, like a very sensitive, um, winsome pastor, uh, uh, says, may you perish with your silver, right? Go to hell, take your money with you. You're in the gall of bitterness and unbelief. Uh, I don't want you here. Get out because you think that you can obtain the Holy Spirit with money. So he casts him out of the Christian uh, community. Uh, he prays for his repentance, but history tells us that never comes. Simon goes and he ends up having another, history tells us, interaction with Peter later on in Rome. And he starts this... <coughs> what would become the beginnings of the cult of Gnosticism. And Gnosticism would largely honor and uh, uh, glorify the name and image and uh, picture, uh, 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 idea of Simon Magus, who we read of in, in Acts chapter 8. So, wherever we see Christian leaders who are there because, not because they have an actual gravity, an actual love of people, or an actual good spiritual influence, but where they've taken leadership because they love manipulating people and they love throwing spiritual weight around and they love the ideas of the Christian truth, but they don't want to actually submit to it in themselves and submit to Jesus. Wherever that is, that's going to start sowing. That's the farmer who sows the seeds of Gnosticism into the church. In it for the money, want to utilize money and other uh, manipulative tactics to use people and manipulate them spiritually. That's often what you'll find at the root of and the beginning of a lot of uh, uh, Gnosticism. Here's the second thing about Gnosticism. God is pure spirit and he's too good to create this evil, horrible thing called the world. 
Okay, so the flesh, the physical world, the physical realm, God didn't do that. Well, God kind of did, but here's how it happened. God sort of had another God, child, baby, emanation, manifestation, whatever you want to call it, another aeon. And then that God made another God who bequeathed another God, who birthed another God. And they have this whole big endless pleroma of gods, like a divine babushka dolls. And eventually you get to one who is powerful enough to create and morally warped enough from the divine spirit to create physical matter. And that is the God that the Gnostics said, that's the God of the Bible. He's the God who made this world, but he's evil for doing so. He was uh, wrong to do it because this world is evil. It doesn't belong to the true God. And so one of the ways that that, uh, uh, so there's lots of other flow on effects, which we'll look at. But in our modern day, wherever you, you see a refusal to acknowledge that the world and the created order, including things like hierarchy, and work, and male and female distinctions, and sex, and all sorts of other parts of the, wherever you see like a, uh, a cringiness about affirming the goodness of creation, you are seeing a seed germ form of that kind of Gnosticism, which says, oh, this was made, and it was kind of God, but God has a much better design. He, he's really over and above and beyond creation. It's almost tacit deism, and that starts uh, uh, sowing the, the ideas that, there's just some things about your world and your life, and especially in this context, your gender. You know, God, God doesn't really even, he's not even particularly happy that you're a man. You know, uh, it happens to be, but you know, uh, he's not really sovereign or happy over that. So that creeps in. The third thing is dualism. Because they believe that God is good in spirit, this world is evil and fleshly and physical. They had this constant, I guess you could say, yin-yang relationship between spirit and created world. Spirit good, flesh physical bad. All of flesh bad, all spiritual bad. And, and, and uh, so, so this constant dualism. If you can do spiritual things, that's good. If you do things that are physical... Uh, with no obvious spiritual element to it, without some kind of angelic communication or divine presence, that's evil. You're demonic and you're satanic because it's not spiritual enough. And I'm sure some of you are already thinking in your own mind how you've experienced that in the Christian church. Often, some, the, the way that this creeps in is that everything good can be boiled down to something spiritual, which is by nature unearthly. Right? The more you can disconnect your life from this physical world, the more holy you are. The more you can get by without, you know, carnal things like jobs and marriages, and that comes up in 1 Corinthians again. Uh, in Thessalonians, they weren't working because they were too spiritual and holy to get a job, and so they just took other working people's money. That's convenient. Basically, if you can live a life that is floating six feet above the earth, and you're in the spiritual realm, okay, you, you, maybe you're not very generous, but you speak in tongues and you don't help out, but you're always in the corner praying, and, uh, uh, praying over people for healings and miracles, and you're not useful and you can't do anything in the community, but you can receive revelations and visions. That's the kind of Gnostic uh, hyper-spiritualism that came up in the early church. Uh, the more physical your, your traits are, or your giftings are, the more sinful you are and demonically influenced you are. So I was to sit down and talk to you, you know, what's one of the ways God's gifted you? And you said, I'm great with my hands. I can build things. I can vision plans. I can make them work. I'm physically strong. Uh, that's one of my giftings. I would say, oh, you've been influenced by the dark spirits. I said, what's one of the ways God's influenced you? And you say, I hardly ever sleep. I just dream. I float in the uh, uh, ethereal realms and I speak to the angels and uh, I have these amazing spiritual experiences. And every time you preach, I can see your aura and I can, it's float and it touches me and I can touch it. That's when the pastor would say, wow, you are one of the, uh, the enlightened ones. That's how Gnosticism basically worked and, and, and works its way into uh, Christianity. So Christians in business, not important. Oh, that's not, a, God doesn't really bother about those things. That's worldly and fleshly, and hopefully one day uh, it'll uh, 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 pass away. Oh, we're building a safe community with stable families and, you know, law abiding citizens and uh, law enforcement that does its job. Oh, that's terribly political. You know, God doesn't care about that sort of thing. That's, that's not really important. That's, um, your safety is in heaven. 
Uh, your children won't be abused in heaven. That's the Christian hope. Right? That's Gnosticism is what that is. Uh, Christian men who build, invest, and then build an inheritance for their children so that they can leave them I don't know, money, uh, maybe houses, maybe lands, maybe cars, uh, uh, all of that on top of a spiritual legacy and lineage. Uh, the Gnostic says, oh, no, no, no. The only legacy you need to leave is a spiritual one. Leave them behind a signed Bible or at least a Kurong gift voucher. That's all. That's Gnosticism. And it's less than the created man is meant to do in this created world, right? Uh, I like to go and hike. I want to go and do uh, a camp trip. I hunt or I fish. Um, I, uh, I chop down a tree. Uh, I like being in nature in, in short breaks amidst all of my hard work. I take my family. We enjoy being in nature, enjoying God's creation. It's a way to refresh. No, no, no. That's worldly. That's physical. That's ungodly. Enjoy, uh, uh, you know, you've been listening to too much Joe Rogan. You need to look within and find the divine light. Nothing out there will, will, will uh, uh, point us towards him. Again, Gnosticism. Here's another thing Gnostics believed, and it was flowing on, and you can already see what I was just, see it in what we were just talking about, but is an elitism in the church. So once you draw the line, spirit good, physical bad, it starts breeding an elitism within the church where the hyper-spiritual guys run the show because they're close to God and the guys who are paying everybody's bills, including the pastor's income, because they work by building things or driving a truck and give money to church, they're now the worldly types. They are uh, less close to God. And that, bre that comes in and, and uh, breeds all kinds of uh, errors. We need to... Um, uh, reject that vehemently and one of the ways to do that is to reject here's the fourth thing Gnostic Christology Gnostic Christology was doesn't matter if you don't remember all these words but their ideas to watch out for Gnostic Christology their view of Jesus Christ in Gnosticism was docetism docetism means um, the appearance or an imagination an image so they say Jesus was was one of the gods in in the world he appeared to have a human body. He appeared to do things like eat food, but he didn't actually. He was actually just a spiritual hologram. And so their Christology of Jesus leaves no room for you to relate to Jesus as a real man. This is how it creeps into the church. Jesus was a real person, but he wasn't particularly a real man. He really was a floating, haloed, soy boy, voting for you know, the greens, that kind of guy. Uh, he was soft. He uh, uh, can't relate to you in any way as a man because while he was God or he was a real person, he wasn't a real man. So we need to embrace, to avoid uh, Gnostic Christology, we have to embrace uh, a true and biblical robust Christology of Jesus' human nature. That is from his conception to birth to the cross, even now in, in heaven, but specifically on earth, he lived as a real guy. He learned to walk, to talk, to read, to pray. He learned history. He learned politics. He learned about uh, the philosophy and the culture and the art of his day. Uh, he swung a hammer. He used a chisel. He was a carpenter. All uh, evidence seems to point to it in the scripture. He drew out plans. He was good with his hands. He worked hard. In Gal Think of it this way. In Galilee, there would have been a bunch of people who sat, ate at, utilized furniture that Jesus as a carpenter had furnished. He was a real guy. He had an actual business. He would have taken over his family business. It seems like his dad is off the picture uh, uh, at least some before his earthly ministry. Joseph's not around. Historians think Joseph probably died at somewhere in Jesus' teenage years. So Jesus uh, took over the family business, kept on uh, uh, being a carpenter, and he was a good carpenter. He would have been a tremendous carpenter. And he didn't do tremendous carpentry by cheating and downloading, you know, stealing heavens like... Uh, stealing angels like heavenly Amish to come down and do all of his woodwork and then zip up again. He did the hard work. He got up at sunrise, walked to his shop, sharpened his chisel. That's the God man in flesh. So Gnostics can't say this, but we can. When you get up early, you go to work, you strike your thumb, you're bleeding, you're having a hard day in the office, but you're pushing through and working hard to provide for your family. You're being like Jesus. 
Gnostics can't say that. And so Gnosticism in the church today breeds a, if you want to be like Jesus, well, be like Jesus. Don't get a job. He didn't have a job. He didn't have a house, remember? He said, I don't even have anywhere to lay my head. Uh, he didn't uh, uh, pay taxes properly. He just stole money out of a fish's mouth. You remember that one? Uh, and, and whenever he got hungry and forgot to pack food like a responsible adult male, he just prayed and God gave him food from miraculously. So that's your ideal d uh, manhood. And we say, no, that's different. There are <laughs> hermeneutical distinctions to make, but Jesus was a real man. He went through... Uh, 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 puberty. He had to somehow prioritize his fitness. He told jokes. He had a favorite dish. Jesus had a favorite meal growing up. I don't know what it was, uh, but that's interesting to think about. He uh, had female friends and I was thinking about this this week. He diverted flirtation in a perfectly respectful and responsible way. Jesus friend zoned ladies in Galilee as he was growing up and never sinned doing it. Uh, he made friends. He spent time with his mates. Um, he grieved when his dad died. He grieved with friends as their fathers died in war or under the Roman uh, uh, brutality. Jesus uh, looked after his home and his family. He stood up for his friends or he stood up for his mother. Remember how angry Jesus gets about Pharisees trying to steal the income and inheritance from widows? I wonder if when Jesus was younger without a father, any Pharisees tried to creep into Mary's bank accounts and manage her accounts for her and steal the uh, Bar Joseph family's money away. I wonder if he did that. But Jesus would have been there to protect them because he was a good, good son. So Gnosticism creeps in in these sorts of ways into the church. Here's another tenant of, uh, of um, uh, Gnosticism in the church. Uh, uh, in the ancient days, they had a uh, mystery, a mystery based epistemology, which is basically how did they know what was what was true? Well, they didn't go to scripture and flick through it because that was very fleshly. They just basically downloaded truths from heaven and spoke to the angels and God told me so. So when you're dealing with a Christian leader or if you as a Christian man are leading your home or your family without objective standards and principles coming from scripture, but you're kind of throwing around your own weight as this is how, what I feel, my emotions are God-given, they're, they're always right, um, I'm going to manipulate people according to my spiritual authority. That's the same kinds of things as happened in Gnosticism. We see it today in the church, we see it today in our own hearts, and we need to fight it. There was also a, uh, an indifference to the body in morality. So this is where 1 Corinthians 6 comes in. The Gnostics said, and we put all these things together, um, uh, uh, my flesh is bad, spirit good. Um, uh, being one of the upper echelon Christians is somebody who focuses and dwells in the spirit, not the flesh. So I guess if I'm trying to think about what's right and wrong, at no point in that conversation comes in, uh, you know, comes forth the question, who am I allowed to have sex with? Because that's a purely physical act, so I can do whatever I want. In fact, some Gnostics became very ascetic and denied their body and tried to make themselves suffer as much as possible in the body without dying because that's good for the spirit. Other guys swung the other way and just went, well, if the body doesn't matter, then I'll do everything. I'll eat more than I need. I'll drink more than I need. I'll sleep with whoever I want to because the body doesn't matter. And that creeps into the church also as we've sort of seen. Sometimes on the spiritual end, on the spiritual end, it's speaking in tongues, worshipping uh, uh, the loudest, uh, 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 praying the longest, all of it. Hyper-spiritualizing everything is the person who's closer to God. He's the real man like Jesus. Sometimes in churches, especially reformed churches, you get the brainy nerds who are the closest to God and just like Jesus because they read the most, they quote the Latin, they study the Greek, uh, they memorized uh, philosophy, uh, they write blogs expressing all of their opinions and thoughts. They're blogging at semper, semper reformanda at creedthoughts.gov.creedthoughts, which you can look up and find all of their uh, interesting thoughts. They're, but they're still floating, but they don't work because they're studying. Uh, they don't start a family because they're busy for Jesus. They don't look after other people because they're too busy uh, looking, being looked after by other people. But that's okay. They're just like Jesus. They're very close to God. 
And so if you put your hand up and say, I'm a worker, I drive a forklift or I do landscaping or I build uh, 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 and fix cars or I teach at a school or I start businesses or I'm in construction or I stack shelves in a, 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 a commercial, whatever it is, if you say any of those things, the conclusion, and this is the case in many Gnostic, uh, Gnostic light churches today, you're just not close to God. The closer to God you are, the less practical you are in life. And the more grounded you are, the less godly you really are. Lastly, the uh, uh, last sort of tenant of Gnosticism that we'll look at is that they had this whole idea of salvation was the um, uh, escape from the body. So salvation in the future is when finally God wraps it all up, leaves our bodies behind, leaves the created world behind, and we enter a spiritual, floaty, non-bodied, disembodied experience. Whereas the, as Paul told us in 1 Corinthians 6, not only does morality and bodily acts matter because we're getting a body back, but the whole creation has been redeemed by Jesus. And when he comes back, he's not just going to destroy it all and get rid of it all. He's going to recreate it on an atomic and cellular level, upgrade it and glorify it so that we will live in a physical world forever with physical laws, the uh, laws of physics, who knows what they'll be in the next round, uh, in the world. Then he is going to create trees again. There's going to be businesses, responsibility. The way that this sort of infects the, ch uh, the church's thinking today is responsibility is momentary and I'll get rid of it when I die. Which means the less responsibility I have is the more heaven on earth. Physical work uh, is going to be done away with eventually. And in heaven, I'll have no physical work. Which means the less physical work I do on earth is heaven on earth. You see how this affects our mindset and our psychology? Um, uh, uh, gender roles will all be gone in heaven. We'll all just sort of have mannequin-esque uh, 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 you know, uh, androgynous bodies in heaven. We'll be male or female. So you know what? The more we get rid of male-female distinctions, the more heavenly our earthly life is. We start twisting this wrongly because of a, a, a Gnosticism or a Gnostic light mentality about what salvation really is. Whereas God's, God's salvation doesn't eradicate creation. God's salvation restores, rebuilds, and perfects creation which means hierarchy, male and female distinctions, order, responsibility, work, morality, physical discipline, all, food. All of these things are going to be perfected and put on display even more so in the age to come. And we know that for certain. Do you know what scripture tells us is the number one proof that that resurrected world is coming for us and there's no denying it. It's that he rose Jesus Christ from the dead as the first iteration and sample that the resurrected glorified world is a reality and it's coming. Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead. We will inhabit a physical, fleshly, embodied world to come. And that, whether you realize it or not, affects your view of the body, of work, of responsibility, and of all of God's creation in this world. Jesus has entered in and purchased for us salvation and we are looking forward to it in a way that affects us. So our aim then is to reject modern Gnosticism in all of its forms. Reject it. Live out your life as a Christian in an embodied, enfleshed, physical, earthy, manly spirituality. Feminists want you to feel bad for being a man. Society wants you to be sorry for being a man. Tyrant governments want you to be harmless in your role as a man. Leftists want you to feel shame for being a man. And your self-pitying feminine side wants you to feel like a victim because you're a man. And God says, snap out of it. I forbid you for feeling sorry for yourself or complaining about it. I've made you a man so that you can be a son. I've made you a man so you can reflect my glory. And he bids us then to treat our, uh, 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 to be a threat to Christ's enemies as men. That's God's order and charge towards us. His two closing applications. First of all, have a well-rounded, full-orbed discipleship in your Christianity. 
That is, uh, sometimes this is called, you've got to have range, brothers. It's not okay to just be super smart and read the Puritans. Do that. Some of you need to read more. But also, be useful with your hands so that you're helpful. People think, oh, I, I need somebody who can come and either help lead the team or do some work at the ranch, on my property, at the church working bee, or on the mission strip. They'll think of you because you're useful and smart. So you've got to be well-rounded and have some range. You need to work on, uh, of course, uh, uh, c- devote and commit your soul to holiness. It is the only part of you that is immortal. You will get another body back, and it is this body, but it's an immortalized body. This body is crumbling, Paul says. The spirit, the inward man, is what we ought to be uh, growing in and renewing day by day. And let's just be honest, some of you men need to give a lot more attention to your soul. Chasing after money, marriage, women, uh, 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 work, income, none of those things bad in themselves. Bad if to the detriment of your soul. Don't chase those things less. Chase soul holiness more and allow those things to take their place in their right order. Uh, This also means uh, uh, that you cannot escape, right? Even if all I said was pursue spiritual holiness, it's impossible to do that without doing physical acts. Because everything you do, you do as a physical person. So even if you said, no, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to go read my Bible. All right, that's a physical book with a physical brain and physical eyes. Okay, all I'm going to do is pray. Yeah, with your body, your physical meat in, the, in your head, you're going to think thoughts up to God. It's still physical. Yes, it's spiritual, still physical. So never ever try and embody a more spiritual than physical life. That's not what pursuing soul holiness means. But in your soul holiness, uh, in your discipleship, ensure it is well-rounded. Your job and your career matter. I hear this... Uh, uh, Hang on, what's up, buddy? No, I can't pick you up. I'll pick you up soon. <coughs> Volunteer dad who wants to uh, pick up. Keith, you, you, can you do with one more? Vic's over there. Do you want to have punch on with Vic? No, you can stand here with me, buddy. <coughs> uh, your job, your career, your, your uh, making money and using it well, these things matter. Your marriage, your family, your sexual life, uh, your thought life, your intellect life, these things all matter. So pursue a well-rounded, all of life discipleship. Uh, your fitness and your health, they matter. Some, sometimes it's put like this. Real manliness isn't about strength. Real manliness isn't about w- your job. Real manliness isn't about making money. Real manliness isn't about your appearance or how deep your voice is. Real manliness is about servant leadership or making your wife happy. Insert dumb false dichotomy here. Of course, real manliness is more than physical strength because somebody who is no longer or does not have the capacity to be physically strong because of disability can still be a real man. Okay. But as a man, your job is still protecting your wife and family. Does that have any bearing on physical strength? Yes. Okay. Manliness is not all about making money. But manliness is about providing for your family or you're worse than an unbeliever, Paul says. So do you need some money? Yes, you need to make as much money as you can make righteously. Okay, it's not about appearance, right? Dressing up like a lumberjack and and growing out my facial hair and talking deeper. That doesn't necessarily make me a man. Correct. But talking with a lisp, wearing skinny jeans and colorful shirts that look like they belong in a Mardi Gras parade is a sin. It's the sin of malakoi in the Greek, which basically translates effeminacy being presented and looking like a a soft female in a man's body is actually sin. And in the same chapter, Paul says, the Malachi will not inherit the kingdom of God. Effeminate men will not inherit the kingdom of God. So yes, actually, those things really are important. They're not all of it, but strength, money, hard work, your masculine appearance and how you present yourself, these things actually do matter because we're not Gnostics. Uh, And so here's my second point of application. First is aim for a well-rounded discipleship. The second point of application is how you do the first point of application, which is be at a church that is anti-Gnostic and be all there. The way that a Christian man sees this all of life discipleship happen, really good news, he didn't leave it up to us to decide how to do that best. 
He literally tells us in the scriptures, be a part of a community of faith that are born again, worshiping Jesus, reading his word, obeying in real time. That's called a church. Be there and be all there. Utilize your gifts there and God will bless you with growth and with all round discipleship. Find, as the New Testament says, leaders that you can follow after and say, I want to be at least a little bit more like them. And where I'm lacking, I can ask for advice. That's what you should pursue. And then be all there. Turn up every week. Ask how you can serve. Worship Jesus with a loud voice and take that spirit home to your family. There's four main things that in the new year we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on yourself, your soul, your spirit, your spirit, your self-discipline, your self-mastery. That's, that's the first thing that we're going to, uh, one uh, arm of what we are uh, focusing on, your godliness and character. The second arm, and some of these are going to be practical uh, uh, workshops that hopefully send you home with actual tools and help. Some of them will be lectures, sermons, uh, discussion times, Q&As. The, the, practice, the exact details are yet to come. But the second thing we're going to focus on is husbandry. Basically, how to be and maintain a good, be in, so get married and then have a good marriage, love wife well. What are some important principles around that? As well as a fatherhood and leaving a legacy. We could call that a, a focus on patriarchy. The third thing is your mission, how you ought to serve Jesus in the Great Commission, serve your local church, and we'll get a good all-rounded uh, ecclesiology. And fourthly is on money. We want to have an actual focus. Because we're not Gnostics. Money is an evil. We want to help you guys. And a lot of young guys struggle with seeing their money as one of the most important tools that God has given them to use for the kingdom and struggle with budgeting struggle with basic discipleship in that way so one of the focuses next year will also be on helping uh, not shaming or embarrassing but helping structuring uh, a men's life to help you uh, have and keep a job make money and keep it well use it well and then spend it usefully as stewardship so if we wanted all m's it will be mastery marriage mission and money if that's what you're after but i really do believe here's why as elders we're looking forward into the future and want to shape and set a on-ramp going into um uh, future productivity because i do believe that by god's grace if the men at hope church are well trained and wisely deployed into the kingdom the men at this church can and will have a disproportionate impact on at least the next three generations in ways that will just keep on bearing fruit and reaping a harvest. And we don't want to waste that uh, resource that you men are at this church. So we want to, uh, that's going to be next year, uh, more details to come. That means we won't do one quarterly men's muster. We might do two or three in a term and you get to the ones you can get to, uh, but uh, uh we're, we're, we're rejecting uh, Gnosticism. We're embracing full orb discipleship and Christianity that Jesus embodied. And we praise God that he made us men. Amen. So uh, I'm gonna, if you can all stand up, I'll pray and I'll hand over to Alex, who I think is going to lead us in some songs. Father God, we thank you that you have made us men. And in this way, you have made us uniquely in your image. Our, our sisters are in your image in a whole different way that we honestly don't understand but we have been made in your image as men and that comes with particular focused unique peculiar commandments and expectations pray lord god that the voice of the age uh the voice of of the feminist spirit the voice of uh, gnosticism and gnostic uh, lightism uh, the voice of our own temptation our own flesh and our own uh, uh, self-justification for sin would not be implanted in us and, and uh, mar and ruin our ability to be holy men who are weapons in the hand of a holy God. So we pray, Lord God, that you would purify and renew our mind, that even as our outward body is aging towards death, our inward man might be renewed this day and every day into Christ's likeness. We pray, Lord God, that at Hope Church, Children and women, wives, um, mothers, sisters are well looked after, well protected, well loved because men, husbands, fathers step into their role, honor you as the first father and uh, follow after your commandments and that those blessings would just flow down uh, the mountain towards all in our community and in our uh, spiritual neighborhood. We thank you for this church, for these men, for this day. We pray all of this in your son's glorious name, Jesus Christ. And everyone said... Amen.